That was a 50-50 situation between Perez and Sainz, and I find it a bit ridiculous that Christian Horner says the Ferrari pulled ahead. The rookies in Formula 1 clearly show that Formula 1 cars are easier to drive than Formula 2. Piastri is incredibly cool under pressure. Lando Norris can learn from him. Hi, motorsportmagazine.com friends and F1 fans. Welcome to AVD Motorsport Magazine with Christian Danner. Edition number 17 discusses the Azerbaijan Grand Prix held in Baku. And I don't know how it was for you, but I was glued to the screen the whole time, cheering like a fan might have done in the past. It was a sensational race, wasn't it? It was a sensational race, not just because of the sequence of events, but also due to the personal rivalries involved. The emphasis was on the drivers competing against one another. I am particularly enthusiastic about these matters. It's impressive how a young guy like Piastri shows such coolness and seizes his opportunity. He also defends it well. Overall, it was just fantastic Formula One racing. And yes, I was excited. We will discuss Oscar Piastri in depth later. But for now, let's focus on the race scene at the end. Carlos Sainz versus Sergio Perez. Now I'm very interested. I have to admit, I couldn't really determine who was at fault in the incident. What does the expert say? Well, I have to tell you up front, it's not easy to figure out. And the stewards had the same issue, which is why they ruled it a racing incident. So then, I have to say, while I was commenting live, you form your first impression, see limited information, and then you must have an opinion. I said that Perez was at fault and Sainz didn't do anything wrong. I have to adjust my view a little. As a Formula One expert, one should never forget to reflect on oneself. It wasn't quite like that. It wasn't Perez who was the fool, nor was Sainz the good guy. It takes two, as is commonly known. And it's true due to these circumstances that arose, Sainz was incredibly lucky that this confusion happened and he could carry that speed. He then made a mistake in turn two. He went too wide and then Perez thought, my dear friend, I'll just take that position back. And you have to say, if you look closely, I also viewed the Top Shots film from above. Then Carlos Sainz steers about two degrees to the left, but not unexpectedly, just towards the center of the track where one normally goes, because by the wall it's dirty and dusty and you should leave that area as soon as possible. Perez sees all of this but thinks, give it a shot, come on, what do you want from me? The fool, sorry, you can't say that, but it wasn't smart because if he had gone left, Perez would have had the next left turn. It was not very clever because if he had gone a few meters, a few centimeters to the left, Perez would have had the next turn a left turn, yes, he would have had it regardless. I must say, honestly, there was a bit of foolishness from Perez in putting his position at risk, to put it at risk, and Sainz indeed moved to the left. However, one must somehow live with and deal with that if they can see it. I believe the stewards, including Johnny Herbert, made the right decision in the end. My goodness, such things happen in racing. What I find a bit ridiculous about this topic is Christian Horner saying the Ferrari suddenly moved over and so on. So, excuse me, I understand he doesn't want to take the blame and it would have been good for Perez to have a success because he drove very, very strongly all weekend great compliment. But in this specific instance, I think it's ridiculous to say he swerved. That was nothing. He moved just a little back towards the track, away from the wall, which is perfectly normal. But I think calling it a racing incident is perhaps the right move. Because we've realized in the past that if there's no one to blame, it's simply a racing incident. 
And if one is truly at fault and the other isn't, then there are rules like causing a collision or forcing off the track or any other rule. In this case, though, two were involved almost equally. One moved slightly over and the other could have avoided it by steering a few centimeters left. So both incurred damage and no punishment was handed out. I believe that was the right decision in the end. Do you think Leclerc played a role since he was basically the unwitting slipstream provider and Sainz was following him a bit? Did Perez not want to allow Sainz the slipstream? Yes? So, what always comes into play are the moments when accelerating out in such situations. You try to maximize everything for yourself. You always try to make everything as optimal as possible for yourself. He surely tried that with Sainz, but believe me, I think it was crucial for him to get away from the wall because there's not enough traction there and there's some dust. You gain traction on the tires and then you can take the next left turn with the right side of the car, which isn't quite right. It won't work properly. So many factors come into play. In the end, it went poorly, resulting in huge damage. And for Perez, it would have been the opportunity of the year to rehabilitate himself. He completely botched that and you can complain about the others as much as you want. Yes, just like I said, I probably shouldn't have been so definitive. It's also about self-reflection. You mentioned that Perez had a really strong weekend, even had Max Verstappen under control. How do you explain that? Track specific, he is indeed a Baku specialist. To be honest, Verstappen's setup was somewhat flawed. Was that the combination that ultimately made it so dramatic? Yes, that's it. The combination of both aspects. First of all, it's clear that Perez has done a somewhat better job with the voting, since I'd like to mention a small detail. What Red Bull brought was an upgrade, which was a, a mixed solution between what they once had and what they would like to have. And that's why the floor and it was only about the floor, was actually a bit easier to manage. So it wasn't too hard to set up and so on, but it was still tough. And that's probably why Sergio Perez succeeded better because he, it's always difficult to say he doesn't have as much talent as Max, but let's just leave it there. Max overcomes many problems as we discussed in this conversation last week. And that's why he is able to cope better with a worse car. Paris requires it just as much as the car has to not act up, isn't always somehow nervous and so forth. And he did that well. Plus, there's a phenomenon that must not be overlooked. This track mainly features 90 degree turns with just a few exceptions. A 90 degree turn is essentially just half or three quarters of a curve. Because such turns, except in Singapore, there are a few others like that. In Russia, in Sochi, there were also some like that. And he has proven to be exceptionally strong there. The car's problems don't really impact things there. And the combination of him succeeding better and being a specialist there has led to him actually being faster than Max Verstappen. That's something to think about. I can't help but smile because someone explained it to me this weekend, Barku. This is such an atypical track, something entirely unusual. Just like you explained karting to complete novices, never press gas and brake at the same time. It's either one or the other but never both at the same time. Yes? Yes, well, it's a one-of-a-kind track due to the big difference between the narrow passages and the long full throttle section. But believe me, those 90 degree turns are over in an instant once you understand what I mean. You turn in and it's already done. And during the curve, a car develops a sort of attitude, so to speak, doing this or that. And then as a driver, you have to manage that. But Baku's curves are slight. You start to turn again. It's almost like our program, which flies by. And unfortunately, we've reached the end of our first chapter, but that's all right. We still have a lot to cover, including your favorite feature, namely hashtag AskAVD. 
All right, now you're the ones asking the questions, not me. Today's Ask AVD segment focuses on rookies, if you want to summarize it that way. The first question comes from the memorable username Klugeberblod. Show the performance of these two rookies, how strong the entire Formula 2 driver field is, and could this lead to a shift in thinking among teams regarding the driver argument of experience? How, for instance, with Audi featuring Buatoletto or maybe even Colapinto? Yes, that was definitely not a dumb question from Klugenblud who wanted to ask this of us or me. So perhaps a brief note on this. I have engaged with this topic very intensively. How can it be that I say, let's say, average Formula 2 drivers in terms of results? I mean, Colapinto was fine, but he wasn't a top performer. Similarly, Antonelli was all right, but not a top performer. The Behrman was fine, but it wasn't the absolute standout we remember from previous times. When Hamilton drove, he won the championship or Leclerc, and the others just fell behind. And now Klug or Blurd has rightly mentioned this. Is this a reflection of the quality of the Formula 2 field, or is it something else? And does this cause a shift in thinking? First, to respond to the first question. It has always been clear that such a Formula 2 field has always been evident, is rather good. But I believe it probably comes down to the fact that a Formula 1 race car is simpler to operate than a Formula 2 car. It's easier to get to the limit, and especially for people who haven't had much practice. I mean, Colapinto hasn't really driven that much. They placed Behrman in the Ferrari and he drove two race distances in Maranello. But I have to admit that this demonstrates that the actual handling of a Formula One car today, if you have the necessary talent and are a good driver, if you can't do anything, it won't work. But it can't be that it's incredibly difficult. What is incredibly difficult? And now the second question, will this lead to a change in thinking? What is incredibly difficult is dealing with the usual circumstances in Formula One. How do I handle the tires? How do I attack? That was, for example, Behrman's problem. He had no idea what to do. Am I going too fast or too slow? The team can intervene and say, this is now acceptable. You're in the delta where we want you, or a bit more, since every little detail shows up on the monitor. The surface temperature of the tires, the tire pressures, the lap times. Then you can tell if there's a bit of wheel spin, or if the wheels are spinning too much, or if there's not enough grip, plus the brake temperatures and so forth how this changes in relation to others like the teammate. Their a pit or a pit wall can provide incredible support. And that's why Hülkenberg, who knew precisely how to deal with it, how fast to go, can drive without hurting the tires at the outset, of course, in no time, really, he overtook Behrman. In other words, experience is still incredibly important. And it's not that you can just change it one to one, as if it's just a matter of putting some kid in, then it will be okay. Sure, it's fast, but doing that over the Grand Prix distance isn't easy. Colapinto is now, and we shouldn't overlook that because the good Hülkenberg certainly made a huge blunder right at the end. Yes, I think it has changed him. Incredibly bothered. When Nico Hülkenberg was with Kai Ebel, I mean, they are actually quite good together, those two. He said, let's analyze. I don't know what happened. The button was pressed and something went on. No, yes, well, pressing the wrong button happens in the best families, but when it was green, thinking it was yellow or red. That is true. 
now we return to self-reflection. That is, of course, already a fatal error in judgment. And there he had, at that point, I think both Hamilton and Colapinto passed him by. So that was really something. Yes, Berman was there. Colapinto was before. That's right. He passed Colapinto when he was with the... When it comes to button issues, you can see that there are always chances to make mistakes, even for the top and most seasoned drivers like our Nico Hülkenberg. But this question is now answered. It is definitely true that a Formula One car is easier to drive and the support from the team is of course immense, which they all receive regarding what they need to do, what they must do or something. That is a big benefit for young drivers and rookies in Formula One. I actually had a second question written down, but you answered it so thoroughly that the question has become almost unnecessary. I was also interested in that. I wanted to know how it works, yeah. but that's not an issue. Now we have a little more time for our second major topic in this edition, which is McLaren. I think they give us plenty to discuss after each race now, Oscar Piastri versus Lando Norris. Actually, he was supposed to drive for Norris starting from the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Now it went exactly the other way around. Totally crazy, right? That's utterly ridiculous. We must examine how this all evolved. First, Lando Norris would have certainly moved up if he had completed a normal lap. Then he would have definitely, perhaps not ahead of Leclerc, but definitely ahead of Piastri. Qualified, so in the... Oh, Christian, I'm curious now because Norris says there was this yellow flag, that it was unfair and so on. That's why he couldn't complete the lap. Do you believe that without that yellow flag, given the mistake he made, and that was a bit questionable, he might have even crossed track limits and so on, would he have advanced? Yes, I reviewed all the times again. There are more than just the sector times for those three. There are also micro sectors. You can see precisely how he stands against any lap times. No, he would have succeeded. I'm completely okay. certain. Well, but no. now comes what I, I also had a long phone call with Gunther Steiner. We are always in direct contact. And he said or asked, you know, I don't know, Norris, what would you have done? Would you, Christian, gone on? Yes, of course, I would have just gone full throttle. And afterwards, we'll see what happens, because at least you would have had a chance. You could still have received a penalty or something, but at least I would have had the chance to get through. I had a hard time with this. I believe Norris is not assertive enough. He should have just said, let's forget the shoe. I'll finish the lap, and then I'll be one lap ahead. That's we'll what Christian the Danner, later. the F1 driver, said, not the safety expert. Yes, that's exactly who he is. That's the racing virus, which clearly leads the way. But that's the first thing. The second point is, I reviewed everything from every perspective I could find anywhere. We analyzed everything at RTL in the control room in super slow motion. When does which light illuminate? Who is waving which flag? Is there a white flag? Then there's the light here, and you have a green light back there, and there's a yellow one too. And that wasn't a yellow one, otherwise there would have been a green one right away, and so on. I have to say the confusion was pretty big. What I can't quite understand, however, is that McLaren says, the evil FIA, this evil FIA, they are just waving a yellow flag. Are you kidding me? If you have one, it doesn't matter, even if the track marshal misjudges it. If you get a report of a danger from race control, the yellow flag must be waved for safety reasons. If it turns out later that it was maybe not needed or could have been done differently, sure, but it's always better. You've issued a warning instead of not warning. For this reason, I believe it is pointless to criticize the FIA, the track marshals, or anything else at this moment. But that was a rather unusual, a strange relationship of various incidents. White light, yellow light, green light, flag, white flag, slow Ocon, etc. Such things can happen. It's a shame. 
I would have tried and driven on. That was qualifying, so it was an unfortunate outcome for Lando Norris. In reality, he would have started much higher than 15th place, so his race was essentially predetermined from the beginning. Now let's discuss Oscar Piastri and what he accomplished. We've observed this boldness from him before, but in this fashion, to pull off the overtaking maneuver and then not make a mistake for 30 laps. I looked it up earlier, and I think he really had around 28 laps or so with Leclerc in the DRS window on average from those 29. 28 laps had less than half a second separating them at the finish line on average. On average. So I must say that was certainly proof of the caliber of talent we have with Piastri. You must not forget he is in his second Formula One season and dealing with a Ferrari in the DRS with Leclerc, who truly knows how to do it. I have to say, from start to finish, an exceptional talent, a remarkable talent. And he also has this, the issue of pressure. I read he mentioned pressure. Pressure. It's in the tires. The pressure is in the tires. He's not involved. And I mean, excuse me, how old is he now? 22. Don't ask me about age. I always have to check when well, I write that. I'm already quite old. No, he's a young man. I was really impressed. First, the overtaking maneuver. Secondly, not just how he noticed it didn't work well in the first stint, but that he also said in the second stint, now I've got you, buddy. Now I've got you. Ferrari helped a bit with a slow pit stop and other things. But when you feel, now I can pull this off. I was delighted. I thought it was just wonderful to see a young Formula One driver like that. How he relentlessly goes for it. And it wasn't like it was dangerous or anything. He was slightly surprised that it was still going well but it was world-class sensational. The defensive actions afterward were equally impressive as the pressure on a young Formula One driver is certainly when you take the lead and the other, the Ferrari behind, wants something from you, it's definitely a bit higher than normal. But what we observed with Oscar Piastri is this added little bit, this extra composure that doesn't bother him at all. He just did what he needed to do coolly without, importantly, being unfair. It was uncomfortable. Sure for Leclerc, but it wasn't unfair. He didn't swerve or cut in front of the other car to create a brake test. Instead, it was just normal defending. And I should say I was very impressed. I was really, really impressed. We at motorsportmagazine.com spare no cost or effort, so I naturally have a prompter, which I just got to know. Oscar Piastri is 23 years old. Thank you, Stefan. All right, so we weren't wrong. But you mentioned this extra little bit that Piastri has, this composure at his young 23 years. Now the question arises, could Lando Norris have made it too? After all, he has proven time and again that when the pressure is on, it's not just in the tires, but in his head. That's the main difference between them. That's where Lando Norris needs to step up, including what we discussed about qualifying. And he definitely needs to step it up. The bar is, of course, already set very high. And this bar must also be met by Norris who is at the top in terms of speed and vehicle control. He is right there under the ceiling. There's not much more room to go up. But in these matters, he must definitely improve. And I think being an intelligent guy, he can apply what he has observed from his teammate. And in that sense, he can learn and implement it. So I see it. It's clear that having two drivers in a fantastic situation is great as they encourage each other. One inspires the other in his strong area and the other way around. Piastri, I've talked a lot with Mark Webber about this, isn't as fast in qualifying as Lando Norris yet. He is working on that. It's all very exciting and at a very high level, I must say. So you've already anticipated my question. 
You said it's a good situation for my team with two drivers like that. I would perhaps label it a luxury problem, as we've seen before the race weekend, that this can certainly spark discussions. Yes, that's how it came to be. You really have to give them credit. First, the car usually performs well, and both drivers are exceptional. What we must also give credit to Andrea Stella and McLaren for is whether they truly wanted it this way or not. One thing is certain. Both drivers reacted in the crucial situation and did what the pit instructed. And Norris also slowed down Perez in the slow twiddly bit through the old town. And those were the two seconds or one and a half seconds that Piastri needed to come out ahead. Honestly, it was clear that this worked well for them together. And I am pretty sure that if it were the other way around, as it was originally intended with Piastri assisting Norris, it will work as well. It will work like that too. It's rare to have such a situation. It's rare for the drivers to be so, let's say, harmoniously integrated into the team. But we must give a big compliment to Andrea Stella and of course to Zach Brown. But let's wait and see. We've criticized them often for mishandling team orders. Perhaps they'll get it right this time. But Christian, do you know what my absolute favorite scene in this race was? Lap 41, do you remember? Do you remember how Piastri and Leclerc drifted from turn 16? Yes, they both drifted one after another. That would be a great addition to the AVD Drift Championship. We should ask if they can race with us. In the cool-down room, where they sit shortly before the ceremony, I mean, it's always a bit tough to understand because the microphones aren't set to high volume, but they talked about that moment as well. They both laughed so much about their actions. I think it was a scene for the history books. The two are racing for the Grand Prix win and both are at their limits, completely crossing over the curb. And I'd say in the classic style of Walter Rural, they're taking it on. That's quite rare to see. That's one thing. And the other topic they covered in the cool-down room, which I found delightful, was this continuous love story between Sergio Perez and Carlos Sainz. They really brought it up. They said these two are trying to get closer to each other and so on. They always seem to want to be near each other. They apparently really like each other. And then Piastri said, well, they finally achieved the goal. They got together. Oh, this can't possibly be true. So things like that are definitely, it's just really cool over there. To be there and experience it, it's cool because they are really great guys and really great race car driver, I must say. Big respect. You said they drove like Walter Rural. I'd drive like Franz Kuncic. He has indeed won the AVD Drift Championship this season in a heart-stopping finale held in Oschersleben. It was really exciting. A huge surprise that he managed to pull it off in the end. Jan-Erik Seber, his title rival, had a bit of technical misfortune, but on one hand, that's part of the game, and on the other hand, it must be natural. It can truly be put to good use, and Franz Kuncic certainly succeeded wonderfully this season. Let's examine this a bit more closely now in the AVD pit stop. Franz, thank you so much for taking the time. We were supposed to have a video call from the garage, but unfortunately that didn't work out. Indeed, yes, I was already on my way to the workshop today, but then I received an alert on my phone from the government warning of severe weather conditions and the road was just unacceptable. There were already severe floods yesterday and I think getting home safely wouldn't have been possible tonight. I'm sorry about that. Yes, I now have to use our Pauli's nursery and we've modified it a bit, but I hope that doesn't interfere with the interview. Yes, we hope everything is good at home and that nothing has happened. Everyone should be careful. The last few days have been tough for all of us, but let's talk about sports. Congratulations again on your achievement. You won the championship title in the AVD Drift Championship and it was a real nail-biter of a finale. Absolutely, to be honest. When I woke up on Sunday morning, I didn't expect it at all. 
But motorsport isn't just about being well prepared to start. Sometimes it's also a matter of luck. Luck was certainly on our side, I must admit. We fought hard for this over the last few years, especially with the Nissan Skyline and the V8 engine with 1000 HP. You might know from drifting that the components are heavily stressed and everything is custom built and custom made. The team has worked very hard in recent years to reinforce the parts. We contacted various companies that have actually manufactured parts that are bulletproof. This certainly contributed to the championship title. I must sincerely thank my, not only my partners, but also my team for that. Personally, as I sat in the car and realized it was official, it felt great. Most of my happiness was for my team, I must say. You mentioned your service vehicle. Would you like to say a few words about your Skyline? What's the story there? I think your car is the most powerful in the field with over a thousand horsepower. That's incredible. Well, for those who aren't familiar with drifting, we try to pack grip on the rear axle as much as possible. We use semi-slicks in the back, which are super soft, usually with a tire pressure of 0.8 bar. This means we really focus on maximizing mechanical grip. To spin that wheel, you obviously need a lot of power generated at the front. The engine is now a... It's an LS3 or LSA to be precise, originally from a Chevy Camaro with a 6.2 liter engine. We've bored it out to 6.8 liters using a different crankshaft, different pistons and so forth, and it's now supercharged. It drives almost like an electric motor. The power kicks in at 2,500 RPM, and the torque curve is pretty flat. And yes, I must say it works very, very well. For those who wonder how on earth you can put an American engine in a Japanese car that makes good engines, I understand. For me, the decision was made earlier. Drifting has changed so much in recent years and the turbo setups are really exorbitantly expensive if done properly. So for me, the decision was that an LS swap is really a good value. Parts are usually very readily available and that was really the reason we went in this V8 direction. Naturally, what is generated at the front has to reach the back which means the Samsoner's sequential gearbox operates almost at the limit. But you have to say, when the tire slips, then the problem with the high peaks and load spikes going through the drivetrain is essentially resolved. And yes, of course, the rear end, the differential at the back is reinforced by Winters. The so-called quick change is installed in the vehicle. Where you can quickly change the gear ratios, often you find yourself in third gear hitting the limiter and fourth gear is too long. Then you can adjust it quite easily since chargers typically want you to stay at full throttle. This means full throttle and if you create too much wheel spin, it can quickly lead to your tires flying off. You need to manage two turns with one set of tires, but it doesn't help if after one and a half laps there's no tread left and you're running on the fabric. So with this winter's quick change, you can also fine tune and adjust the wheel spin at the rear. There has been a significant amount of progress in this area of drift sports. Next, we have the half shafts that need to transmit power to the wheels. It was a burn child before referring to stock parts. Definitely a no-go, it doesn't work, but we have found a solid setup now. So torque curve and response behavior like that of an electric motor, but thankfully the sound is still a bit different. Old school, but you like it for sure. We'll be rooting for you that everything runs smoothly. If your competitors need a bit of help, just let me know. We're just around the corner and I can help with your car, so the competition won't have to worry next season. Sure, luckily I have your number. <laughs> then thank you very much for taking the time and all the best for the future. Thank you. Yes, congratulations, Franz Kunzic. It was close, but I think you deserved the win. So, drift in this edition is practically double for you. On one side is the AVD Drift Championship, and on the other is Formula One, which has been given a boost in classic 80s style. We hope we won't have to wait long for such scenes, because the Singapore Grand Prix is coming up next weekend. 
we're curious. I think a race as exciting as Baku will be a bit challenging due to the track's characteristics. But Christian, Formula One is always good for surprises. The Formula One thing is always good for surprises. And we at RTL will be broadcasting at least the qualifying in Singapore, which I am really excited about. Singapore is certainly a race where we experience incredible qualifying pressure, much like Monaco. You have to be in front, otherwise nothing goes. Therefore, we are excited not just about the qualification with you, but also about the analysis in the AVD Motorsport magazine once again with you. Thank you very much for issue number 17, for this spectacular race and this spectacular edition. I'm happy too. It will always be spectacular. Don't worry. Regardless of the topic, if you have any questions for me, please use the hashtag AskAVD.